It's the oldest question in the world. If God is good and he's all powerful, why does he let evil run rampant on this world? You've asked it yourself, yes? The real question we should be asking is not that one. Although we will try and deal with it from scripture. But the real question is why hasn't God wiped you and I out years ago? Why has he allowed human beings to continue on existing when God has zero tolerance for sin? That's the real question. Not that us as sinful people question God. How dare you allow suffering, Lord? The Lord is saying, well, how dare you ask me the question? You should have been dead long ago. Because I don't tolerate sin. That's the real question. But we're going to try and deal with this this morning from Scripture. The Bible gives us some of the answers but not all the answers, but it gives us enough answers to leave this church this morning satisfied. But there will still be some mystery, but there'll be enough answers from providence to assure you that God is there in your darkest hour, whether you believe it or not, whether you sense it or not, makes absolutely no difference. I visited a lady the other day who was paralysed from the head down. From the neck down. She came to my evangelistic meeting three years ago, full bodied. And now she can't move. And I had to try and comfort the lady and bring the love of God and some answers, although she is a believer. You can understand her faith is sorely tried. And my heart goes out to her and I ask you that you pray for this lady. Her name is Leslie. We love her very much. And it's that visit that prompted me to prepare this message. God is there in the darkness, whether you believe it or not. We think of God as living in light. Ellen White often said, when she came out of vision glory the earth seemed so dark but did you know God is even in the darkness we read in Exodus 20 that Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was we might have missed that in our readings God is in the darkness We don't understand it at times. There are many mysteries. But one thing we do know is this. That whatever happens to you as a believer. Is to prepare you for a future. That only God can see. That's what Corey Ten Boom said that. Marvellous statement of truth. Every little thing that happens to us. As believers, is to prepare us for a future that only God can see. Marvelous statement, isn't it? And yet the Bible is full of pain. You know, from chapter 3 of Genesis right through to the third, last chapter in Revelation, the whole message of Scripture is pain. Suffering, shadows. But remember this you can't have a shadow without light. We only complain about the shadows because we sense that there is something better for us. And we talked about it this morning in Sabbath school. There can be no shadows without light, there can be no pain and complaining and moaning and groaning unless we know inside ourselves that we were meant for something better.
The message of the Bible is not unbroken periods of prosperity. I don't care what the American preachers are telling us today. That's nonsense. These people don't read their Bibles and they don't quote the Bible when they're preaching. They strut the the stage in fancy suits and fancy lighting with 20,000 people listening. Come to God and he'll prosper you. That's nonsense. And I'll tell you why. Because in Revelation we read, God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Don't forget and don't miss it. This is saying the tears of the redeemed. God will wipe away the tears from the eyes of the redeemed. Don't forget it. And this is not what the prosperity preachers are telling us. Come to God and he'll make you prosperous. He'll make you wealthy. That is nonsense. Yes, you are blessed when you come to God. But the sort of blessing God has in mind is, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are those who mourn. And blessed are those who are poor in spirit. There's not one beatitude in Matthew 5 that says, blessed are those who gain material wealth because of faith. There's not one beatitude in that along that theme so the tears of the redeemed but I want to tell you this and if you forget everything else that I say which we tend to do the preacher's words are forgotten but I want to leave one thought with you that will stay with you for the rest of your days that if you're a child of God if you're a believer no pain can touch you unless it passes through the screen of God's presence first. Nothing can touch you unless God allows it. Nothing can touch you unless God allows it. And I get my source from the book of Job where Satan said I want the Chaldeans to steal Job's donkeys and his oxen. I want the Sabians to take away his camels. And I want to whip up a storm and bring the roof down on his children. And then I want to cover Job from top to toe with boils. But I can't get to him, said Satan. And it says in Job (coughs) chapter 1, Haven't you put a hedge around Job and his household? The devil is complaining that God had built a protective hedge around Job and he couldn't get to him. And he does it with you and he does it with me. And whatever comes my way that gets through that hedge has passed the security check by God Almighty. Whatever pain comes my way has been given an access control card with a unique code that the reader can read and the gate opens. God says that bit of pain can go through for Herb, but not that. And that brings tremendous comfort, doesn't it? Tremendous comfort to know that. And it takes away the complaining and the groaning and the moaning, although it's quite human to do that. But when we know that, that there is a hedge around us and that whatever gets through is allowed by God, it brings tremendous comfort. Jesus said the same in case you're thinking, well, it sounds a bit glib. How do I tell that to a person who's hurting in hospital? Jesus said exactly the same. Aren't two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of those sparrows falls to the ground apart from the Father's will? Aren't you worth more than sparrows? And so the great God who controls untold numbers of galaxies attends the funeral of every sparrow because of the ultimate purposes that he has in mind. 
Okay, we've talked about the Bible full of pain and God allows the pain to get through that he permits and nothing more. Well, why have pain in the first place? No one likes it. We stub our toe and we're on the phone telling everybody. We get a cold and we're, sent, and we're texting people saying, I've got a cold. Woe is me. That's us. So what's the purpose of pain? You know, our oysters are formed, don't you? A little bit of sand, just one grain of sand gets into that clam shell, that oyster shell. One grain of irritating, intrusive grit gets into the clam shell. And the oyster doesn't like it. It's irritating, the membrane. And the oyster secretes a healing balm and surrounds the grit. And over time, that healing balm solidifies, it becomes a pearl. Why am I using that this morning? I've got nothing to do with an oyster. I'm using it because in Revelation we're told the gates to the kingdom are made of pearl. So that whoever passes through those gates may be reminded that you have passed through much tribulation. You don't get a crown without a cross. Cross first, then the crown. That's the order of business. And so the gates are made of pearl as a perpetual reminder that the redeemed have suffered the irritating, intrusive grit of the day-to-day -day dramas and sufferings and trials on earth. And they've endured and they've, they've accepted it as part of the package. It is part of the package. I'm not a prosperity preacher. I will not go to the United States. I will not stand on these big platforms with these guys in white suits and white shoes and talk wealth gospel. The Bible knows of no such thing. And millions are being disappointed by this false delusion. You know, the story is told of fishermen on a gigantic lake catching fish. It took them two or three days to get back to shore. And they kept the fish in live tanks to keep the fish alive. And they couldn't understand why their fish arrived without flavour, limp, listless. But the other guy on the other boat, who was their competitor, his fish were always fresh, full of flavour strong and they, they couldn't understand why and when the competitor died he t before he died he told his daughter the secret of his success he did exactly the same as, his other, as the other fishermen he put his catch into the life tank just like the other fishermen did but one difference he put a live catfish with a venomous spine in that tank and those fish we're on edge in a constant state of agitation. Looking over their shoulder for the, where's the catfish? Keeping them strong. Keeping them in a constant state of readiness. So when they arrived at shore, they were not limp. They were not flavourless. You get the moral of the story? There is nothing worse for us as believers in Jesus Christ than to have unbroken periods of prosperity. Nothing worse. Because within a week, we become arrogant. Our dependence on God drops off. We become proud. We become independent. You've seen this when Christians come into money all of a sudden. Things change dramatically. Out goes the faith. In comes the materialism. And the character deteriorates. There is nothing worse than unbroken periods of prosperity. And if you don't believe me, remember the fish story. We need to be on red alert at all times as the enemy of souls does battle with us.
just like that catfish. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our suffering, but he shouts to us in our pain. When everything is fine, God's voice to us is but a whisper. And when we have a bit of pain, God's voice is louder. But when we are totally flawed by tragedy and trial, we hear God's voice the loudest. Because when you're flat on your back, there's only one way you can look, and that's up. And when you're standing tall, confident, and erect and alert, your eyes are looking horizontally on the things of earth. So God often pricks the bubble of our illusion that we're capable, that we're strong, that we can do it without him by allowing pain into our lives. That's why the hedge, the gate opens at many times, but not every pain comes through. But he needs to prick the bubble of our illusion that everything's fine, we're going to live forever, we're capable, we're not fragile. How many times have you seen it? Arrogant people brought low, like Nebuchadnezzar. He needed those years of madness. That was, he was a hard nut. So he needed special treatment. So God allowed it on Nebuchadnezzar for his ultimate conversion. We don't know everything. I uh, have the privilege of uh, emailing, uh, engaging an email with many PhDs in our church. Doctor this and doctor that. Some of them have got two. You know, there's one thing they all have in common. They say to me, Herb, the more I learn, the more I realise how little I know. We don't know much about anything. We know so little. So how can we expect to know about the mystery of pain? You know, God asked Job a whole string of questions. In Job 38 and 39, and he said to Job, who has divided the path for the thunderbolt? Has the rain got a father? Can you mark the time when the deer gives birth? Have you given the horse strength? Whole list of questions. Chapter 38 and 39. But Job doesn't answer. Because he doesn't know. We don't know much about anything. And God is saying to Job, listen Job. If you can't answer these simple questions, the mundane things of life, how can you expect to know the mysteries of providence? You know what happened this week? In case you missed it, don't worry. It'll be back in 117 years, so you'll see it then. The transit of Venus. I missed it, but I'll catch it the next time. If I follow the health message. I'll live long enough, perhaps. You know, this doesn't really interest me that much, but what I found fascinating, and these are photos from NASA, they're not photoshopped. That little black dot is Venus, passing between Earth and the Sun. And the size of Earth is about the same size as Venus. So that little black dot there, for all intents and purposes, is the size of Earth. That's how big we are. And that's just the sun. And then there's the galaxies. And then there's the universe. And then there's all the other universes and galaxies. And yet on that little black dot, there's one little tiny person with a big ego. He's so small that you'll never see the dot on the dot. Questioning God, why suffering? We don't know anything about anything. And that's what Job was meant to learn when God asked him all these questions, saying, where were you 
Where were you when the universe was flung into existence? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water? From whose womb comes ice? From whose womb comes the frost of heaven? Job just don't know, don't know, don't know. And so the Lord is gently telling us, well, you don't know much. Be content with being less than God. I'll give you some answers, says the Lord, about pain, but don't expect all the answers this side of eternity. Paul tells us we see through a glass darkly, through a mirror dimly, but we do see, we do see. But it's distorted vision, and it's foggy, and it's misty, and it's myopic. Those of you with short-sightedness, take off your glasses. And that's how well we see most of the time when it comes to spiritual things. So we'll never, ever get all the answers this side of the kingdom. But we do see, we see some things. So why did Job suffer? What was the whole purpose? Why put this man through such trauma? They took his camels and donkeys and oxen. A storm blew up and the ceiling came down and killed his children. And then he was covered with boils, scratching at them with a piece of pottery. Why, 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 why? Why do this? What's the point of this? Because God is saying, you see that servant Job? I'm going to show you that he believes in me and holds on to me for who I am and not what he can get out of it. I'm going to show to angels and to men that this servant, this believer is holding on to me because of who I am and not what he is trying to get out of it. Because Satan said, does Job fear you for nothing? The devil thought Job is hanging on to God because of what he can get out of the relationship. Put your own name there. Does Herb fear God for nothing? Does Lloyd fear God for nothing? Does Andrew fear God for nothing? Does Lumi fear God for nothing? Or for what you'll get out of it? I'll tithe and I'll wait for the investment to come back. I'll give a tenth and I'll wait for the return. I'll go to church once a week and I'll wait for the return. If that's your attitude, you've missed the message of Job. God wants us to hold on to him for who he is and not what we can get out of it. It's not a business deal. It's not a business deal. And so the Lord conducted this experiment. You say, oh, that's a bit grim. Does God play with human beings like Job to make a point? It sounds like that, but Jesus did exactly the same. He said exactly the same. In uh, John 9, the disciples said, Rabbi, this blind man here, who sinned? Was it him and his parents that he should be born blind? And Jesus said, neither this man or his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. It's exactly the same principle. The man did nothing. His blindness wasn't a punishment for sin. He was born blind. And Jesus said, it's not a question of sin. It's a question of God's work should be revealed in him. And then he makes the clay and he puts on the man's eyes and the man sees. And instead of getting this gospel message, the Pharisees said, oh, he did this on the Sabbath day. He's a Sabbath breaker. They didn't even see the healing. They saw nothing in the healing. They were more worried about the, the law of the Sabbath. How blind people can be. The real blind people were the Pharisees. Not the blind guy. 
And Paul says the same, we are made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. It is an experiment, if you want it for want of a better word, to show angels and onlookers that Seventh-day Adventist Christians and believers in God held, hold on to God because of who he is and not because of what we will get out of it materially. Now we should know this better than any other denomination because we have unique doctrines. It's not the Sabbath and it's not even the sanctuary doctrine. Our unique contribution as a church to the broad body of theology is the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Now we live on a battleground, we don't live on a playground. This is a unique theological contribution of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I came across a photo of our leaders in Washington that moved me to tears when I saw this. These dedicated leaders, this is not posing for the cameras, this is a very candid photograph. They are praying because of the great controversy project which is, going to, which is underway soon, I believe, Lloyd, yes? Where 50 million copies, I believe, of the great controversy are being printed. 50 million for distribution around the world. To get the message out to a world that is obviously disintegrating fast that there is a great controversy underway, that it is a spiritual battleground, it's not a playground, and that when you stand for truth and when you stand for Christ, life will get even harder sometimes because you're bringing on yourself the forces of darkness. If you've ever been asked to preach a sermon, you'll know what I'm talking about. The pressure that is on you in the week or weeks leading up to the the delivery of your message is so intense it makes you physically ill sometimes. The great controversy between light and darkness, between Christ and Satan. When you become a Christian, put your bulletproof vest on because the going will get tough. But there's one difference. God gives you the power to endure it. And non-believers cannot boast of that. Let's talk about the sovereignty of God. By sovereignty I mean he is the supreme ruler, knows everything, he sees everything. That's what I mean by sovereignty. The sovereignty of God and your ability to cope when tragedy strikes. Either you or your relatives or your friends, your ability to cope, your ability to keep trusting, your ability to be at peace in the midst of a perfect storm, that ability comes from your accepting that God is sovereign. The book of Revelation paints some terrible pictures of oppression on the church, persecution on the church, famine, earthquake and martyrdom in chapters 6 to 19. Terrible, terrible pictures. But it prepares us in chapters 4 and 5. Before it unleashes this panorama of suffering on the reader, it prepares us in chapters 4 and 5 because in 4 and 5 you find the term throne 40 times in just two chapters. 17 other times it's used in the whole New Testament but it's used 40 times in these two chapters alone. Why? To get it through our thick craniums that God is sovereign, that God is on the throne, that God is in control. We are not in control. That he sees farther than we do. And if we could see as he sees, we would choose as he chooses. God's on the throne. And 
it says in Psalm 119 that even that all things are his servants, all things. You know, it logically follows that if God, the great God of creation, is, is as great as we read in Scripture, if God's greatness extends to infinity, then he's aware of every stick and stone. He's aware of every creature, great and small. If God is great to the point of infinity, the great God who swung the universe and multiple universes and multiple galaxies and multiple suns into existence overrules even the evil that is committed by his rebellious creation. Think about that. I'll say it again. The great God of creation overrules even the evil overrules the evil committed by his rebellious creation. A wise old Jew who survived the Holocaust said when he was asked, well, why do you believe in God? What you've been through? And he said, when you know God, you don't have to ask why. When you know God, you don't have to ask why. Not many people have that capacity. And so the sovereignty of God where even pagan people, where even unbelievers are used for his purpose. The Bible's full of those stories. Nebuchadnezzar is one. Pilate's wife is another. Remember Pilate's wife? In Bible times, a woman would never take a message to her husband where he's working. It just wasn't done. Particularly if you're a magistrate. But God sends this woman a dream. God makes sure she doesn't forget it. God makes sure that she delivers the message to her husband, the busy lawyer, breaking with biblical convention, and says, have nothing to do with Jesus, have nothing to do with that man. Think of this, the detail and the sovereignty of God in that story. And there are plenty more. Jesus says to his disciples, listen, go into that town you'll see a man doing something unusual that only women do he'll be carrying a jar of water only women did that in Bible times men didn't do it in Bible times they still don't do it even today they don't carry the water in some countries and Jesus says now when you see this unusual man with the unu doing this unusual thing don't talk to him just follow the man and he'll lead you to another man who owns a house. You can talk to him and just say, look, the teacher has need of a room to celebrate the Passover. And without fuss or complaint, the room is made available. Think of the detail in that story, the sovereignty of God. God is in control of time and people and property. He's even in control of fish. When Jesus and Peter had to pay tax, and Peter is freaking out because the tax man's coming. Jesus says, Peter, go to the lake. And he draws to the surface of the lake just the right fish who had earlier caught just the right coin for just the right amount to pay just the right tax. Next time you stub your toe or break your leg, think about this. God is in control of every little, tiny, fiddly, seemingly trivial thing that happens on this planet. We've got to expand our minds and take in the breadth and depth of the sovereignty of God. Then you will never complain, worry, bite your fingernails when you have a bad week. I've had a bad week. My wife's had a bad week. We had a tough week. And my wife said, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm preaching on suffering. She said, how appropriate. And then the story of the cult that was acquired without any complaint by its owner. Just walk up to the man and say, the master has need of the cult. Untie him. 
And the owner just goes, yeah, sure, no problem, here you are. Now that's bizarre, but that's what happened. Because God is sovereign. You see, big doors swing on small hinges. The big events of life swing on tiny events. The little things that happen from hour to hour to hour to you as a believer all wrap up into, into a much bigger panorama that only God can see when it happens. Big doors swing on tiny hinges. So when you're tempted, we read this verse many times, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And we say, well, hang on, that's talking about an enticement to sin. Did you know the biblical understanding of the word temptation is more than just an enticement to sin? Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Imagine going without food for 40 days. The suffering ordeal and the agonising trial that would be. Then he was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sweated great drops of blood. That's not an enticement to sin. That's more a suffering ordeal. So the word temptation, and you can look it up in the Greek, means much more than an enticement to sin. It means a suffering trial, an agonising ordeal. And God is saying, I'll make a way of escape when this hits you and you'll be able to bear it. Take that promise with you. Take this promise with you. When the doctor says to you next week, you've got prostate cancer. When the doctor says to you, you may have leukaemia, we're not sure, but we'll get some tests done. When you get a phone call from Queensland, a family member says one of our family members has died in a car crash. And I don't want to trivialise these things because some of these trials can sour us rather than sanctify us. I don't want to trivialise it. But the Lord is saying here, when tragedy strikes, he will make a way of escape and he will only give you what you can bear for a purpose that only he knows at that time. You've got to believe it or not. As a Christian, we believe it. And it makes the whole experience much more tolerable. But when pain strikes, most of us, our faith drops. And we whinge and moan and complain over the smallest of inconvenience. It's embarrassing if God has a tape recorder going and were to play back what we've said during the week be pretty embarrassing. Our tolerance level for inconvenience is very, very low. But what happens to us is not so important as what happens in us. You know, you can have a ship in a storm, you don't have a crisis. You have a crisis when the storm gets in the ship. Now you can be in a storm, it's no crisis. What happens to you, it's not a crisis. It's what happens in you, there's the crisis. And so we have to dig deep into the resources that only Christianity can give to deal with the tough times. We're going to be like a child with a broken toy where the boy just rushes up to dad and just plonks the toy in dad's lap and says, dad, fix it, and rushes off to play. We're going to be like that. That's far more pleasing to the father. If I was the dad and that happened to me, I'd be far more impressed with my child if he did that than if he's lying on the floor prostrate, prostrate, begging, begging with me to fix his toy. I'd be embarrassed. Because the child is showing absolutely no confidence in me whatsoever. So we need to be like this. Be like the little girl with the tangled ball of wool and just dump it in mum's lap and say, Mum, untangle it. I'm off to play. Be like that. And forget the self-pity. 
We all do it. Woe is me. Woe is me. Look what's happened to me. Because when we pity ourselves, we are trapped in a hall of mirrors. We're seeing a reflection of ourselves. It's all inward looking, isn't it? Isn't it? Instead of a hall of mirrors, we need a window where we look out. But it's perfectly okay to ask why suffering. It's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And I'll tell you why. I'll take you to the cross for a moment. We sang the hymn, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. There are more lessons about this subject at Calvary than any other incident in Scripture. Because here, every, every ingredient of a perfect storm was put upon Christ. Think of the worst tragedy that's happened to you. And I'll guarantee you that there were more elements in this tragedy than in yours. Because here we see pain and strain. We see rejection. We see shame. We see hatred. We see limitation. We see nakedness and thirst. A terrible injustice. We see delay and distortion and misrepresentation and mystery. You see all these things here. There's not a person in the world that's had all that. They got close, but they wouldn't have had them all. And then on top of all this, Jesus had the guilt of every person ever born dumped on him in six hours straight. On top of that, on top of all that tragedy, there was all the guilt and all the penalty of every person ever born dumped on Jesus in just six hours. If we can draw some lessons from that, we'll, we'll be much stronger when we leave this morning. How did he cope? You say he was divine. Well, he was human too. Don't forget he was human. He didn't call on his divinity to get him through this. He called on his humanity. And the opening words were what? My father, forgive them. And the closing words were what? My father, into thy hands. He opened his sermon on the cross with Father and he closed it with Father. The only way he could cope was to be aware of God's presence. He would never have survived. Even though the arm of love was pushing him away, Christ clung to the Father. And that's what we should do. Now Jesus asked why. It's okay to ask why. He said, my Father, why have you forsaken me? He asked why, but he didn't hang around long because he moved on and said, Father, into my hands I commit, I commit my life. And so it's okay to ask why, because Jesus did it. But don't stay there for long. Move on to, into your hands I commit my life. You see? And Jesus is positioned in this position strung between heaven and earth because he's rejected by both and yet his arms are going this way to say to us I still love you all now we don't all need to be hanging on crosses like this and to go to this extreme that's not what I'm saying but we can draw lessons from it the worst tragedy in the world and Jesus endured because he clung to the father he continued to believe in the Father and his arms of love were still outstretched and he turned Black Friday into Good Friday so there could be a Resurrection Sunday. So when the crosses of life are put on your shoulders, think about Jesus and how he coped and how he endured and what the secret was. Believing in the sovereignty of God 
trusting in his presence, even though he couldn't trace him. And that's what got him through. So there could be a resurrection, the ultimate purpose. Simon of Cyrene didn't want to be there that day, wasn't meant to be there that day, just standing by as Jesus passed by. He must have thought, what's this terrible trial that's been dumped on me? This cruel, heavy cross thrust onto my shoulders. But Simon found that in being Christ's cross-bearer, the cross would lift him. In lifting the cross, he found that the cross lifted him. In lifting the cross, he found that he was brought into fellowship with Jesus. So when you have your bad week that could be coming up next week, think of Simon of Cyrene. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, take up your cross. He didn't say, if you want to follow me, get in your Ferrari and I'll see you at the Gold Coast in the penthouse. He said, take up your cross. Be prepared for suffering. Be prepared for self-denial because that's the path to the crown. That's the path to the resurrection. Jesus answers all prayers, but not all prayers are answered with a yes. And in eternity... We're going to be thanking God for those no's. Because when you know everything and can see further ahead than your sinful creation, a no is as good as a yes, isn't it? Paul said, I've got a thorn in the flesh, Lord, please remove it. He asked God three times and the Lord said no. No, no, the Lord answered his prayer. He was Paul the Apostle, and he was knocked back three times. So don't get discouraged when God says no. It's in our best interests. Lazarus, Mary and Martha said, Lord, please come back. He's dying. Well, Jesus didn't get there in time. And when he did, he said, I'm glad for your sakes. I'm glad that I wasn't there that you might believe. What is this? I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. Please explain, Lord. So Jesus explains it in John 11. Because if he had have been there before Lazarus had died, you would have no hope of the resurrection. You would have no hope that one day you will see your loved ones. Because that seemingly temporary downturn that upset set people up that people might believe that their loved ones will one day be raised just as easily just as easily as Lazarus was raised now let's just quickly wrap up and get rid of some myths the first myth is all trouble is good for your character That's nonsense. Trouble sours me. Trouble sours me. Sometimes. Doesn't sanctify me. It's wrong to say this. All trouble is good. Some trouble is, but not all. Because often it gets us down. But God allows these upsets to set us up. God allows the downs to lift you up. God allows the humiliation to give you glory in the long run. As long as you abide. I was asked the other day by an Adventist woman, how can I know God's will for my life? How can I know that what happens on a weekly basis is God's will? And I said, and it must have come from the Holy Spirit, because I had no preparation. I said, if you're abiding in Christ, day by day, whatever happens to you is God's will. So, if trouble hits you, it's God's will. Take it with glee, and when I have a bad week, 
and I'm whinging and moaning, you pull me up and say, Herb, you preached that sermon the other day. What are you whinging and moaning for? We need to encourage each other when things get tough. So that one's a myth. Another one is, well, trouble is punishment for all the sins you committed. It's all catching up with you. You must have been a really bad sinner before you became a Christian and now you're copying it. That's nonsense. Because Job was an upright, perfect man. This righteous man from the east. And God allowed pain to hit him, to get through the hedge. So that's nonsense. And the last one is, trouble comes upon you because your faith is so small. If you had bigger faith, you wouldn't have so much trouble. Well, tell that to Paul the Apostle, the great apostle of faith, who asked God three times, take the thorn away, Lord. And the answer was no, the trouble stayed. Remember this, there's a hedge around you as a believer. And whatever hits you is allowed to get through that hedge because God has allowed it. There's a lot of stuff that could have hit you and God's held it back. But what he's allowed to get through is because he knows better than you and me at his best time, in his best way, for his best purpose. If we believe that, bring on the pain, bring it on. If we really believe it, we'll welcome it. If we don't, we'll display just how deep a Christian we are when we end up in hospital and we whinge and moan. You can whinge and moan for a couple of minutes, but don't go on and on about it. That's what the Lord is saying. I'm here to strengthen you. So I'll leave this text with you because that's the escape that God has promised. God bless you.